are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. I always look forward to speaking with my next guest. He's a good guy. He does good work. Uh, I knew about him before I knew him, uh, and uh, we're here to catch up. Uh, I'll tell you this about him since we haven't talked in a while. I think everybody over the age of 50 in the United States of America knows who Bowser is, and a lot of people under 50, too. But, uh, but uh, Bowser, uh, former, uh, the other group members might object, but uh, I would say front man for Sean Na, game show host, many other things. But beyond that, he's uh, an extremely knowledgeable and active uh, a leader in the political world, particularly as president of Social Security Works, but he also knows every congressional district in this country inside and out, as well as the lyrics to every hit the Cadillacs ever recorded. So without any further ado, John Bowser Bauman, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you, Richard. Oh, yeah, there you go. I mean, thank you. I get the schizophrenia. Uh, yeah. It's called code switching. It's a it's challenge. It's all the you know, time. You know, and the, uh, I should say I'm president of Social Security Works PAC. Because oh, did I not say PAC? Other, yeah, I don't think so, because otherwise Nancy Altman will, will be... will be. Yeah, um, she would be yeah, offended. Yeah, yeah. Both of us. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And since she's so, recommended, uh, she's actually president of Social Security Works, the overall uh, organization. organization. And, you, yeah. so and you're I'm the political... President of the... Of the Let's get decent people who are not going to destroy both Social Security and Medicare elected part of our effort. That's yeah, and then persuade them to continue along those lines once in office, right? Hold them accountable if they don't. Um, you know, hopefully it doesn't take persuasion once we have gotten into the campaign, endorsed them, trained them how to run on those issues which is probably what the most important thing that i feel like i do uh which is you know make sure that candidates understand not to run compromised on those issues not to run milk toast on those issues not to back off and do republican light on those issues because it's the best way to lose every time and you know politically john it seems to me we we've talked about this before but you read the polling data or what have you, it seems it's not just a no-brainer to run on uh, protecting Social Security, expanding Social Security. It seems to me to be like a negative brainer, like you have to be actively stupid. Not, to, I mean, not obviously there are other reasons why people might uh, want to cut Social Security, what have you, but, but it, it seems to me that from... Uh, leaving aside right or wrong for a second, just from a strictly political point of view, the polling seems incontrovertible. Yes. That the right, I mean, uh, that Always. people want Always. it protected and expanded, right? That's Republicans, that's everybody. Always. Right? And it, on the other hand, you know, it's easy to see how this develops. And, you know, when you work with campaigns for long enough, you realize that consultants are really running campaigns. And the yeah. consultant class is conceivably the biggest enemy of doing something rational that there is. You know, there's a lot of people running around in the world just trying to get paid for for not really paying very much attention. And uh, I think that's a huge problem. And we have to counteract that at all times. So what happens is, you know, I specialize, as you know, in the swing districts because right. the swing districts are the races that ultimately determines the next time period and whether we're going to be able to get anything done you know right now we had a wonderful cycle in the house in 2022 relative to what expectations were and <clears throat> i'm one of the few people who predicted it you know i said the entire time there was not going to be a wave there's certainly not going to be a red wave <clears throat> that's crazy it's not going to happen um, I don't see where the 25 to 30 seats that were projected for Democrats to lose are going to be lost. But, um, you know, the, the hardcore reality if, is if we 
won five more seats, you wouldn't be going right. through all these bizarre, ridiculous weaponization of the government, you know, committees with Jim Jordan running them. None of this would have happened. We would have still been in control. So I was right. It was going to be a slim majority for one side or the other. It should have been us. We should have won five more seats. Um, and and it wasn't. And oftentimes what happens in these swing districts is, you know, the candidates get convinced to sort of run what I what I'm calling these days Republican light. I mean, we're essentially nonpartisan, as you as you know. Right. But right. that's absurd at this point in time. I mean, there is I I send out a questionnaire in open seats. I send out a questionnaire to both sides because nobody has a federal track record usually, you know, who's running in an open seat. Right. So I send a questionnaire to the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate. And I'm sure we'll go over our questionnaire in a minute. It's very simple. But um, I can literally tell you, I've never received a questionnaire back from the Republican candidate once ever. Never. It doesn't even come back. Like nobody even deigns to answer the five simple questions, which, okay, let me throw this in right now. They are. Will you support protecting and expanding Social Security? Will you support protecting and expanding Medicare? Will you support Medicaid expansion as, as defined in the Affordable Care Act? Will you fight to lower drug prices? And will you always refer to Social Security and Medicare as earned benefits and never use the pejorative term entitlements? And for the entire time that I've been doing this, a Republican candidate, you know, with no track record, never mind incumbents. Incumbents I don't send it to because they've already told you <laughs> through the vote right. that they take uh, that they have no interest in protecting and expanding these programs or actually trying to destroy them. But, you know, to be fair, if nobody has a track record, I send it to them. It's never been sent back once. That's really interesting. And, and you know, the reason why it's, I would say it's never been sent back is because everybody knows how popular these programs are and how important these programs are and i mean in politics everybody knows right and and they know how unpopular their positions are so they're not idiots i mean they're not going to tell you what they really think except sometimes they do you know I, I, and this gets to one of the things that frustrates me, John, about the the political discourse is I did an article before the election, uh, before this last election, in the American Prospect about a video. Now, this was a video that was put up on YouTube. Uh, I don't know if you saw the article or not, but yeah. put up on YouTube, Republican members of the House Ways and Means Committee talking about Social Security and Medicare and it had like 630 views according to youtube right nobody saw it but they said we can't tell anybody what we're going to do they literally said that which is why you don't get answers right totally. so so on the one hand i you know I, i'll admit it i get frustrated sometimes when democrats hedge or you know whatever when they talk about hey, we could talk about commissions or whatever but but the fact is, you know, maybe one reason you were right in November is that people always forget when they talk about a red wave that there are actually Republicans on the other side of the ballot and that, you know, they it's not just a matter of the Democrats not being as strong as they might be because of economy or whatever uh, and incumbency. They actually have to elect the guys who, at some point or another, may have tipped their hand on some of these issues. You know what I'm trying to say, right? And they turn people off mightily, and and you know, generally the Democrats, as long as they're well schooled in in how to run on these issues, um, make it very clear that they're on the right side of these issues. That are great crossover issues. They're the best crossover issues that there are to attract independents and moderate Republicans. Um, you know, just as you referred to earlier, and we just got a new bunch of polling back from Data for Progress that reveals the same thing. You know, these these are overwhelmingly popular programs. I mean, we might as well say, to be clear, I usually start um, 
all of my social security talks, you know, by discussing the fact that uh, social security be before Medicare was passed in 1965, over 35% of American seniors had incomes below the poverty line. And that's a staggering number. Yeah. And before social security was passed in 1935, the one that really gets to people is that over 50%, more than one out of every two uh, American seniors had incomes below the poverty line. It's just a simple fact that Social Security and Medicare have been the two most successful pro domestic programs in the entire history of the United States of America. And as you said, we need to not only keep them that way, we actually need to expand them. And most voters know that. It's reflected in every poll that comes up, you know, do not, do, do not, not only do not cut my social security and try to take away and privatize my Medicare, but expand the programs and make them better because they work. And, and look, let's go to the, to the really absurd place. Um, but I think it's kind of sardonic fun to remember in the good old Tea Party, you know, before MAGA, the, the, the precursor to MAGA, um, remember those signs where people were going to Tea Party rallies, you know. Hands off my Social Security or what? Government hands off my Social Security. Keep the government's hands off my Medicare yeah. was my favorite, right. my favorite. Okay, it's not very smart to not know that Medicare is a government program. Uh, so keep the government's hands off my government program doesn't really make a whole hell of a lot of sense. But what is the underlying message of that signage? It's don't touch my Medicare. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and that's interesting, too, John, because, you know, I was thinking as you were talking that, OK, Medicare and Social Security, probably the two most popular programs the government has. Right. And yeah. they are they are wildly popular the social security wildly popular both government programs so people can appreciate when the government can do something for them and it seems to me that politicians should be less and, and they're getting better we can talk about that but it seems to me they they should not be timid about saying, hey, man, your government can help you. Look what it's doing for you. We'd like to do more. It seems, and, and I guess from a 50,000 point of view, John, we've been in these trenches a while, you longer than me, but I've been writing about Social Security and, and, and Medicare at least since 2005, so, you know, going on 20 years. Uh, it seems to me that the landscape, at least among Democrats, is shifted and whatever chronic irritant, maybe from the left to the Democratic Party, the fact is that the Democratic Party has moved, it seems to me, maybe there may be individuals we could talk about, but as a party, it seems to have moved substantially on this issue. It feels to me like the driver is not, drivers of that are not the squad. It's what uh, Nancy Pelosi used to call her majority makers, right? It's, it's right. exactly those swing state Democrats. Democrats, blue collar Democrats, and so on. This to me is the new face of Social Security expansion, Medicare strengthening. Now they may not be for Medicare for all or what have you, but it seems to me that at least some of these politicians, I love your thoughts on it, but my impression is that at least some of these politicians in the front, in the swing states, have learned that working people like these programs, they care about these programs. And you don't have to be what you call Republican light. In fact, it's better if you if you come out swinging. I'm thinking of, I think one of the first ones I noticed this with was uh, Lamb in Pennsylvania. But it, you know, it seems to me that this is uh, this is a coming trend and a promising one. But what do you think? Um, right on the money. My 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 favorite, my real poster child for for um, for this in my own experience was uh, actually John. Ossoff in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember back, and a lot of people have forgotten, but uh, John Ossoff, who was very young and was a staffer for Hank Johnson. Uh, Hank Johnson is a is a um, congressman who, from Georgia who was actually John Lewis's best friend, uh, and and really progressive guy. You know, good, great voting record. 
Asaf, very progressive person. Um, when I went down there, when he ran in the special election for Georgia 6, which was a winnable district that we won the next time. Right. Uh, so this was maybe 2017. I mean, some year like that. Uh, the years all run together for people like me because last last cycle I went to 35 campaigns on the ground. In 2018, I went to 57, which was probably my all-time record that I'll never break at the age of almost 76. Um, but, you know, the years tend to jumble up, but I think it was like that, around 2017. So I went to Ossoff. Um, we did a few events. I was there for several days um, in this special election. We did a few events, including one huge one with about 400 people there, you know, which is really good turnout for a senior issues event. And, you know, he had signed our questionnaire and, you know, checked all the boxes. And, you know, they wrote, usually it's not the candidate, it's usually some staffer writes in nice things. Um, all sounded good. But during the event, he, I was just shocked. He was so equivocal about these programs and so running what I call Republican light, you know, because clearly some consultants had gotten to him and said, look, this is a swing district. You know, you can't be too definitive on these things because we're going to need to pull over some independents or Republican votes, you know, whatever this, this bizarre and wrong and completely wrong narrative is. And, you know, I was biting my tongue, um, this entire event i was biting my tongue not to just jump in and say no no that's really you can't say that that's totally wrong and it's going to turn off everybody in this room and sure enough you know he lost that election right um okay fast forward to when he ran for the georgia senate with a completely different team and a, and a much harder race because now he's statewide right right Right. Um, and he had learned to run as himself, you know, and that, that's another big problem with candidates is that when you're not authentic, people sense it. Authenticity is probably the number one thing. So when you're when you're not only wrong about uh, on an issue like the way he had run on Social Security and Medicare the first time. But also, you didn't believe him because right. I knew that he didn't believe a word he was saying, you know, about, about, oh, let's find a bipartisan solution because we have to, you know, compromise on this and that and the other thing with regard to these programs. And everybody senses that that really wasn't him. Now, sure enough, the second time when he ran for the Senate, it was completely different on those issues and a lot of issues. And if you remember, you know, famously, uh, I think he won that very difficult Georgia Senate race by turning to David Perdue in the debate and said, saying, sir, you are not only a crook, <laughs> you know, where he was so definitive and so good, so much better as a candidate. And that's always the trap especially on these particular issues. Uh, Democrats especially must run hard, authentically, not back off, um, because no one likes it. And I think as you, and no one meaning the electorate, no one meaning voters, it's a good way to, it's the quickest way you can lose. And people like Connor Lamb that you mentioned, you know, I also went to his race and spent, you know, the better part of a week there when he ran in the special election. And, you know, many people, including me um, and you, you know, can argue about with Connor Lamb about his position on firearms, for instance, you right. know, Western Pennsylvania, which, by the way, do you happen to know where within 100, 100 miles of what American city are there the most firearms? Sort of a convoluted question. York, Pennsylvania? Well, big American city. Oh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Correct. That yeah. is the correct answer. And most people don't know that. Yeah. So Connor Lamb running in suburban Pittsburgh, um, you know, his position on, on guns is one that 
Now, gun safety is one that many uh, Democrats, in, in, including us, you know, would probably have quibbled with. Um, and we did, but, you know, you could kind of understand that issue in that region as being complex. But he had the good sense to run as hard as anybody on Social Security, Medicare, drug prices, was as good as anybody and turned out to be an excellent congressman in that regard. And, uh, you, you know, yeah. we work with him all the time in Social Security works. Well, a couple things about that, John. One is, uh, it's interesting. Interesting you mentioned Ossoff's first race because I actually did a precinct by precinct and demographic breakdown of the 2017 race that he lost. First of all, he yeah. underperformed Hillary Clinton, who had run there the previous year, which shows that he left some votes on the table, right, yeah. by the very strategy of tacking to the center that you're talking about. And if you look at some of the different groups, including, uh, you know, various kinds of working people, single mothers, uh, uh, so on. It wouldn't have taken a big shift in some of these groups for him to have won that race. And, you know, he learned that lesson. He he unleashed himself, you could say, in the senatorial race. Oh, and while you were talking, I was also thinking about what Harry Truman didn't say. He's often quoted as saying, uh, but he said something like it. It's been simplified to in a race between a Republican and a Republican, the Republican wins every time. The, the moral be don't run like a Republican number. Don't but the Connor, the Connor Lamb thing is also interesting to me. You know, you mentioned the gun issue. You know, it, it speaks to me a lot because, you know, when you're concerned about the welfare, uh, the best interests of people, and you've got a Connor Lamb who, you, who I personally, you're right, disagree with on the issue of guns. Um, but people's lives, I could see, would be materially better. In fact, I disagree with a lot of Democrats about a lot of things, but when I can see that people's lives are going to be materially better if we get a Connor Lamb in there instead of somebody else, then, you know, that maybe he's going to support, you know, we could talk about John Larson's reintroduced his, uh, you know, his Social Security uh, expansion bill and so on. It, that... At some point, you got to make the decision that, you know, you, you. in my case, anyway, I continue to espouse what I believe in and fight for what I believe in. But if there's someone out there who's going to help on one of these many fronts we struggle on, I think that's worth taking note of, right, particularly in these swing districts. And Connor wasn't, wasn't you know, horrific on gun safety. He's a guy who's a veteran, you know, right. with his own military background. And he was actually quite good on articulating, because of his background, he was quite good on articulating that weapons of war don't belong on the streets. Yeah. For instance, um, he, he, you know, he was he was less aggressive, I would say, with regard to to uh, uh, there are just too many guns in America. And then you and I, I think, both think there are just too many guns in America, guys. You know, this is uh, yeah, how, but this how, is how are we going to function as a society this way? But his perspective was still useful. It was still overall a democratic side perspective. Um, the only point that I'm making as far as his ability to win that swing district was that he really understood how important Social Security, Medicare, and drug Medicaid and drug right. policies were to that electorate and, and ran as well and as passionately as anybody. And that really helped in that, in that district. Now, Chris DeLuzio, who has succeeded Connor Lamb, is altogether just much more progressive than, than Connor, period. And he's also a veteran, by the way. Uh huh. You, you know, with a, with a very similar background. Uh, so that I think also buttresses something that you have just said, which is that all of this has generally moved in our direction. All of everything has generally moved 
in a more progressive direction um, in the country, and I think in the Republican Party, too, uh, the, the Democratic Party, too. Um, the Republican Party, which is why I got ahead of myself, right, has right. become this bizarre mega cult. Um, right. And they weren't so great it, before. It, you know, I way, mean, right. It was bad enough to begin with. Right. But now it really has become a cult of personality of Donald Trump, which in no way uh, it is broad enough to win a big a, a big general election or a swing you know or or a large swing seat election i mean they can win narrow elections where the electorate is just like them and that's another right. subject in controlling a majority i think right. democrats should have learned last time and i was one of the voices in the wilderness that you know but i do have access to the powers that be enough to say, why are we treating Lauren Boebert's district the same as we're treating Marjorie Taylor Greene's district when Lauren Boebert's district is like, you know, in, in uh, what's called PVI jargon, you know, like like what the voter index is, how many registered voters are there? You know, Lauren Boebert's district is kind of a, is kind of a Republican plus eight in Western Colorado. Whereas uh -huh. Taylor Breed's district in northern northwestern Georgia is like a plus thirty-two. They are not the same. Lauren Bobert's district a couple of races ago had a um a congressman called named Scott Tipton, a Republican congressman who was, you know, a fiscal this one of the so-called fiscal conservatives, which is a complete lie to begin with <laughs> right of course There's never any such thing right democrats two, tr two three trillion dollar tax cut for the rich no, it's just uh, tax yeah. cut. their entire thing let's just cut to the chase yeah. on that, which is kind of where we started richard you and i you and i both know that republican world is about literally nothing but tax cuts for their for their big donors right that's the entire thing there's no yeah. mystery to it and there's not anything else to it so Scott Tipton was a typical, you know, like, okay, let's just get give tax cuts to the donors, um, you, you know, kind of guy. He had no particularly other opinions. He wasn't a culture warrior of any particular sort. And, um, you know, Boebert unseated him in a primary. Um, as I remember it, he may have retired, but I think she beat him in a primary. Um, but at any rate, that was a vastly different district. It wasn't out of our reach. Right. And sure enough, last time, she won her race by 500 and something votes without any help from, let's say, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee or the powers that be. E even the slightest amount of help, uh, she's out of Congress. Right. And, and, and this gets... Sure uh, I'm, do stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes, you know, I wish people would be more tactical about this stuff. I, you know, sometimes it's emotionally satisfying to throw money at somebody who's running against, let's say, Mitch McConnell, when if you'd sent that money to Wisconsin, instead, right. it, you might have had a way bigger impact. But before Most important you go, point of all is that one that you okay. made, which is, you know, I'm going to I'm going to back back that point up, which is pay attention, listen to us who actually know what we're, we're doing. I love the guy, Marcus Flowers, who's, you know, probably going to run against Marjorie Taylor Greene and Georgia in, in, in Northwest Georgia um, next time again, but don't send the money. Send the money to Adam Frisch in Colorado, in, in right in Colorado, right. Uh, in Western Colorado, because he he's going to win if if you support him. Good point. We'll I'll have you back closer to the election to talk more about those races. But before we go, one last point I do want to make, because I've been writing about it, thinking about it a lot, uh, and that's commissions. Yeah. Educating Democratic politicians. You know, it can sound reasonable to say, hey, well, why don't we have a commission to look at how much we need to cut Social Security? 
Well, but when you think about it, say, hey, why don't we have a commission about whether or not we should drown your mother? I mean, she costs a lot. She's sick all the time. She's a whiner. You know, it's like, no, there's some things that you don't think about. Right there's something first of all politically suicidal, but more importantly morally wrong. So I don't want a commission to think about drowning your mother. I don't want to think about a commission to cut Social Security or, or Medicare. And I'm I would think the party work as president of the Social Security Works PAC is to uh, you know make sure that our uh, democratic elected officials understand that. But am I wrong? No, you're right, and uh, you said it. You said it perfectly. Yeah, yourself, which is that the whole problem with commissions is that they sound reasonable. The entire history of commissions is that they're only there, there to do one thing, which is to cut the programs. So we don't need to cut the programs. Everybody knows we don't need to cut the programs. Every, every poll shows that we don't need to cut the program. We need to protect and expand the programs. So don't put people through a, through a stupid commission again. Uh, you know, we might as well go over the history of the last stupid commission, which was, you know, love Barack Obama, but the Simpson Bowles Commission, which we prefer to call the Bowles Simpson Commission because the initials work out. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's in fact what it was. So that commission was was a complete waste of everybody's time, and not one thing that that commission recommended ever got uh, turned into law because it shouldn't have it just got dumped by barack obama who mistakenly had created it so don't fall for the trap of the commissions we are all busy convincing uh relatively conservative democratic politicians not to jump on board with any kind of stupid commission ideas social security and medicare and drug prices are a very simple set of issues uh for americans the programs are super successful they need to be protected and expanded the drug prices need to be cut uh high drug prices hurt everybody and we're still even though the biden administration has made really good progress and we're really proud of what they were able to accomplish with a difficult congress um you know with so-called control but between Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, that's not real, wasn't real control of the Senate. They were able to accomplish a lot. Medicare's negotiating with uh, pharmaceutical companies for the first time in American history. We need to do more and you need to elect the right people. Well, as good a conclusion as any. So as always, John Bauman, Bowser, uh, musician, uh, celebrity, uh, president of Social Security Works PAC. Uh, as always, thanks for like, your tireless hard work on behalf of this issue. And man, you really do work hard for an old guy. And, uh, you know, uh, so thanks for that. And it's always great to talk to you. And thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure. At the end of the, at the, end of the next cycle, on election night or whenever all these elections are decided, Candidates who who will protect and expand Social Security, Medicare, and lower drug prices have got to be doing this. All right. Uh, and for our people who are listening on the radio, you just have to picture the Bowser gesture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks again. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.